please rise and join us for the pledge of allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. changeover happening tonight so the message that I'm bringing is for you know kind of everybody that's in the room and you know in addition what I'd like to take a minute to talk to you guys about um, is something called a community emergency response team a CERT unit have you guys anybody here familiar with that some of you guys are okay so we do not we do not have a CERT team in Harrisonville and um, what I want to do is I'm just going to read you uh, just real quickly what the Federal Emergency Management Agency says about this, because this is kind of where it came from, um, especially after Hurricane Katrina. <laughs> um, basically, let's see here. Um, CERT educates individuals about disaster preparedness for hazards that may impact their area and trains them in basic disaster response skills, such as fire safety, light search and rescue, team organization, and disaster medical operations. Using training learned in the classroom and during exercises, CERT volunteers can assist others in their community following a disaster when professional responders are not immediately available to help. CERT volunteers are also encouraged to support emergency response agencies by taking an active role in emergency preparedness projects. I can tell you, uh, you guys remember the Joplin tornado? CERT helped out down there. Uh, if any disaster that's happened lately, CERT has been there. Uh, Harrisonville's got over 10,000 people in it. I think it's time that we formed a CERT team down here. I am on the CERT team, the only one that I know of in Cass County, and it's up in Raymore. 
We need Glenn and Harrisonville. And we're doing a uh, CERT training in June. And we have a handful of people that's on the CERT team up in Raymore from Harrisonville. I know some other people that would be interested in joining the team. And I would like to actually ask for the support of the city and the city agencies, especially the first responders, in uh, reaching out to the community and building such a team. Um, I've been in, in contact with Ryan Murdoch, who is the Raymore Emergency Management Director, and uh, kind of the, the head of the CERT team up there. And he's indicated that <coughs> I have a 20 plus year background in public safety and emergency management. And he's indicated that you know, maybe I should help lead the team down here. So that's why I'm here, is to introduce myself to you. Hi, I'm Mimi. And uh, I would like to bring this to your attention. And maybe we'll be able to be in touch about this uh, sometime soon. I think it would be a fantastic thing for the city. I know nobody ever thinks a disaster is going to happen until it happens. Right? So it's better to meet everybody beforehand and change cards on the ground when it happens. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Can you be sure to leave your contact info with people over there and we can be in touch? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Do you take old codgers on that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we do. <laughs> Is there anyone else who'd like to speak this evening? I fortunately have sense. Um, hello, my name is Jim Gray. Um, I live in uh, 29 Thunder Bird here in, in Harrisonville. And I'm here on behalf of the Children's Playhouse over on uh, 1305 uh, Sanders Street. Uh, what's occurring there is they have uh, people living on the side of their property in an RV. I've got pictures there. Uh, and I can, you know, if you want to pass them down. And, and they're actually living there and they burn trash every day and they on the kids every day i got a three-year-old there and every day my three-year-old comes home smelling like trash and smoke and uh, uh and it's uh it's becoming a, a pretty big issue as far as uh, people there that are there <laughs> Are living in that RV that I just stay in there during the day that actually live there. Is that correct? And uh, these are these are the ladies that work at the uh, children's so care uh, playhouse. And, um, and what what they do is that I guess they 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 just they burn all day long. Is that correct? They're gonna they'll they'll talk here in a moment. But I just wanted to 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 kind of bring it up since it's, I can't, you know the other people have mentioned the problems there and. Uh, it's at 1400 South Butler, uh, and the Children's Playhouse is at 1305 um, Sanders. And as you see by the pictures, they, that Winnebago or whatever it is, RV, is right up against that fence. And they don't have other pictures, but they also have wood all along that fence, and they burn that wood all day. And they, you know, the kids smell like campfire, you know, basically. at. Uh, at night when they get home. I mean, they just smell terrible. They also burn trash, is that correct? They burn trash. What, what else do they burn? Like yeah. we, we've had to go inside because it hurts to breathe it in. Sometimes it burns, you know, noses and throats, and the kids will complain that their eyes are watering and that it stinks, and so we have to go inside. We can't enjoy the nice weather because these people burn, and especially when it's windy, which it has been lately, it just blows straight on over. It doesn't bother them at all because it blows over our fence and into um, the playground, and children with allergies, asthma, things like that. But we have some letters from the parents that have um, the children with asthma that is affecting them and things like that. So um, I don't think you're supposed to have a residence in the back of someone's yard in a camper anyways. Um, These people are homeless a lot yeah. of the time too. They just come in and out. They we, peek over our fence, talk to our kids. Um, you never know who it is because it's not a legal residence and they just come and go. and. It is an, a safety hazard, not only a fire hazard, but a safety hazard for our children who are out there with these people. Don't know who they are, but they just come and go, and they're right there, just an arm over the fence reach away from all of these children running around. And, and uh, there's no uh, no hookups or anything there, no electricity. So I don't know where they go to the bathroom at, but I can only assume. Uh, so. I, it's, it's becoming a, a real big problem, and for this business, uh, kids are going to start pulling their kids out of. Uh, people, people are going to start pulling their kids out of that daycare, and then they're, you know, that's going to hurt. That's going to affect their business. 
So I was under the impression it was a burn ban. I, I don't know. I talked to Sergeant Kincaid about this matter, and then I talked to the, to, to, to the fire, that fire <coughs> captain, and I talked to another fire captain. Eventually they said there was nothing they could do that they could burn in a barrel. But I, I, did, I didn't know what it was. And, and I, I guess what we're doing it's here is, is to ask for some help and see if there's something we can do. If there is a bird ban, then we need to enforce it. Because I think the only way that these people are going to um, uh, correct the situation is any kind of monetary damages that we can place on the property owner. The property owner lives in the house. It's a, it's a mother of a, and I guess she has a 50-year-old son that allows all these people to come over, is what I was told by, <coughs> by police. And so, uh, if there's a burn ordinance, then I, I would sure like to see that enforced and or start giving citations. And if there's not, I would sure like to see one. I mean, <coughs> just for the common good of the kids, at the, at the bottom line, at least, is no burning until after they're out of there at 6 o'clock. Um, uh, I mean, if we could, I mean, there, I mean, is there, I, mean, I guess, is there a burn ban? Does anybody know the order? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Open, open, burning, yeah. no. Mm -hmm. There is not a burn ban on in, within the city. There are burn restrictions that allow people to cook on the barbecue grills, on smokers. It also allows them to have chimneys and fireplaces, mm -hmm. which have been purchased and that are UL listed for such purposes. So that's why burn barrels are not legal uh, by ordinance. They're not allowed to be used. And ever we run across those, we make sure that they get rid of those, tell them to put it out, quit burning, and to get rid of those. Uh, regarding this property, I have been there three times myself, and they are burning in a uh, smoker. Every time that I've been there, the wood has been in the burn pit or in the uh, burn barrel part of that. Uh, the housing for burning, and they've actually had food on the smoker. So that falls within the guidelines of the, uh, of the ordinance. Um, the smoke does smell. Uh, I'm an avid smoker myself. It's something that I wouldn't cook on, but um, he falls within the guidance of the, the ordinance. There is a burn barrel that is on the property as well. He was advised that he cannot burn in that burn barrel, and he was asked to have it removed from the property. He asked me, or he told me that he was going to get removed. And that was, over, well, it was on Friday when I got involved in this situation here. So. Was that the person that you were talking to is the actual resident of the home or the people living in the RV? Did you know? They would not. I talked to the homeowner okay. um, as well as the person that is staying in the RV three nights a week. I think that would be the biggest issue as that we need to look at is if we take care of that problem, I think the other problem would go away. So that's, from a code standpoint, they're good. I visually saw that they were cooking food on, on this device. So, so. I think that's my issue too. I'd rather, I, I, I really want to see the codes be enforced. Like, I don't, I don't think he needs to be living right next to our fence and I can't burn someone's back to that. I don't see how that's legally right at all. Rick, do you know if we have it? I thought we had an ordinance against living in an RV on a I mean, he's correct clearly property. Exactly and correct. this would constitute a complaint so I could send the uh, official out tomorrow. Okay. Mm -hmm. That would be fantastic. I think, I think that would resolve everything. Yep. Yeah, I appreciate your help on it. You know, I want to hear it cause trouble. I just wanted to kind of bring it to because I mean I've got letters here. I don't know if you want me to read them or one of them or doesn't matter, but there are letters from people. Some kids have asthma. It's an emergency room uh, right here for this guy. And, I mean, there's it's just uh, it's become a, like I said a problem. And I think it's more of a cat and mouse game. Unfortunately, you guys have a hard job because you're trying to find them burning other than meat, but when my little girl comes home, she doesn't smell like a brisket, she smells like smoke, okay? she smells like trash, and they burn trash in that barrel, do they not? Yep, we've seen them burn trash while they were cooking just to I mean, cover they have two smokers, two smokers a burn barrel and a smoker. <coughs> so I think it's a cat and mouse kind of catch what you can game, so appreciate your help, appreciate you listening to us. Um, yeah. Anything else you have, guys? I, I would just like to see him just off my fence line, off my, I mean, he's kind of off my fence line, but I'd rather just see him not living there. 
Yeah, I mean, he's, 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 he's really far. He's really far from his mom's house. Um, he's really far. We understand people need to leave uh, to live and to cook, and but he should. They shouldn't be so close to the daycare. You know? I mean, I have a no trespassing ordinance on him, anyways, from the police. Like he's not supposed to be anywhere near my children. That's impossible. He lives right next to my kids, and he literally peeks over, talks to them. You know, it's just. And then the smoke now is just taking over my yard, and it's just another, another not okay thing. So it's just, I'd, I'd like to see the codes enforce mm -hmm. that. We'll send him out there tomorrow, and we will get called up on that. I appreciate that. Thank, thank you for your time, guys. Thank you for bringing it to our attention. Mm -hmm. Appreciate your time. You bet. Thank you. Does anyone else like to speak tonight? Seeing no one, I will close public participation, and we will move on to the approval of minutes. Uh, first, we will approve the minutes from the special meeting of March 21st, 2016. If we approve the written I have a motion from Alderman Coburn, a second from Alderman Dickerson. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Minutes are approved. Uh, minutes from the regular meeting, March 21st, 2016. If they be approved as written? <laughs> motion from Alderman Coburn and a second from Alderman Dickerson. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Minutes are approved. Minutes from the work session of April 4th, 2016. Motion <coughs> approved. I have a motion from Alderman Milner, a second from Alderman Bowman. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Minutes are approved. Minutes from the special meeting of April 4th, 2016. You want the second line? Oh, yeah. She can get all of your last one. I have a motion from Alderman Dalton and a second from Alderman Stahl. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Minutes are approved. <laughs> Moving on. Huh? That was in there. <laughs> it's all right. All right, moving on to some unfinished business. Uh, Council Bill 022. A resolution authorizing the city administrator to execute a design build contract with Cass, Burns, and McDonnell to make repairs to the digester basin floor at the wastewater treatment plant at a cost not to exceed $845,850. Good evening, Good evening, Mayor, members of the board. Uh, this is a project we've had tabled for the last couple meetings trying to work out contract language. Uh, the issues have been with what related to liability insurance, consequential damages, and, and so forth. Uh, we've sat down with Burns McDonald's attorney and Sidenauer <coughs> and J.D. Moore to, uh, to try and work, come to a reasonable resolution. Uh, this uh, this a contract that you have or agreement right now uh, does not reflect uh, everything that the city attorney has uh, had requested to be in the uh, in the agreement. However, I was also told it's not unusual for cities uh, to accept uh, the liability uh, as identified in the, in the contract. So it's not unusual. Certainly, Jesse can answer any questions you have with respect to that. If there's concern, it's going to be our recommendation that we proceed with the contract. This is a replacement of the floor in our digester. Uh, if we were to start over with the process, we're looking at, at months to, do, to get everything back. Uh, where we're ready to issue a contract and we do need to get the digester floor repaired quickly and this is the best method uh, to do it. Uh, so our recommendation is proceed with the contract even though it doesn't meet uh, some of the liability uh, limits that uh, we were hoping to include in the contract. Uh, Jesse, respond to any questions or concerns the board might have uh, with respect to what we do have in the contract. <coughs> Questions from the board? I would 
a, a question, Jesse. Can you tell us how long it would be before the contract information, the contract information that Steve has asked to be added, can be added? My understanding was that uh, the negotiations essentially had an impasse, and it was sort of a take it or leave it from Burns and Max. So I don't believe that the provisions Steve and JD were recommending could ever be added into the contract if you want to proceed with Burns and Mac. It's been sort of a take of it, and Jerry, you can, I think, back me up on that. Um, the contract that's in front of you all is what's been offered from Burns and McDonald if you want to proceed on uh, the project as it is now. This is Burns and McDonald and Cass is a joint venture. And it has to do with the design build and uh, some of those limitations. This is not your traditional brief design, and you go out and bid a project based on an engineering uh, sign uh, design where you know what you're, you're bidding. This is based on a perception of what looking at the uh, problem saying here's how I think we're going to be able to fix it and the engineer and the contractor consulting together come up with the best solution. This is a risk reward as we were talking about before. If we want to be real safe then we do a a traditional design uh, and then fit it. But to be uh, sure what the design needs to be, we're going to have to excavate that floor out. And ex excavating the floor out so we can see what is going to be necessary to tie everything in, that's about a $400,000 cost before you ever get someone to come in and replace the floor. And so this is this was the best, best method for us to construct a replacement on the floor for this project. <coughs> and I'm, I'm sorry that we weren't able to come to an agreement, but I have a lot of confidence in Burns McDonald. Uh, Burns McDonald and Cass have done a lot of uh, design builds <coughs> together, so I have a high confidence. If this is somebody I did not know, then I'd be very hesitant to move forward. Now, Jerry, the condition under the floor was favorable, if, if I remember correctly, when they, they got underneath there, the, like the clay and all that was, it was a better than we thought. Uh, this, this is what they're assuming, uh, based on some preliminary uh, cuts that they made into the concrete floor, that it is going to be very favorable to the solution we have. And there is a, we've divided it, divided it into milestones. And the milestone where the floor is removed and excavated, you're about 50%, 60% into the project cost. But that's a point where we're going to take a step back, look at uh, the information, and say, does it make sense to move forward? If it makes sense to move forward, then they're going to guarantee that their project will work. But there's some limitations on liability and so forth. If they make a mistake, and I, Jesse, correct me if I'm wrong, if there's if they screw up or something, you know, we'll be able to go after them uh, for for something they did wrong. If it's just they blatantly did something wrong, so, uh, I think this is our best approach to get it fixed. Or our other approach, if we don't want any risk, mm -hmm. is we go in, we design a new one, we tear it down, and and we build a new structure. And that, as we mentioned at the beginning of the process. You're now looking at over a million and a half, two million dollars. There's also an element of time. And there's an element of time. Jerry, do they ever give you, sorry, do they ever give you an indication if they get in there and it's not exactly what they expected, what a ceiling would look like for <coughs> the project? If it, what's the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario is the excavation. Uh, it's 400 and It's milestone uh, two, which is $445,850, which is removal of, uh, of the four plus the $75,000 for the contract. Right, I guess that, that is the worst case. Uh, we'll know at that point in time, do we move forward or not? Right, but I guess my, I guess my, I guess my question is that's all those excavation dollars are 
they're not, I guess, usable if the project has to go forward. And that, I mean, I mean if, if they get in there and find out we got a big problem, then that's that's gone money, right? That's yeah, not if we can't fix the floor uh -huh. and put a floor in, then those are gone dollars. Uh, but it's, I think we're down to two solutions. Either we're able to fix the floor as it's uh, designed, or we have to build a new digester. Uh, I don't think there are other solutions. Is there a different way to build the floor? It's. Okay. I thought in their presentation they were confident the floor could be replaced and save the walls. They are indicating. <laughs> they, are, they are indicating that is the best solution for us. Should everything be as they've uh, they've estimated? But they won't know that until the floor is removed and they do an excavation uh, down two feet. Uh, they'll be able to look then at the uh, footings and the walls and be able to make a determination. And that's why at Milestone 2 we're going to take a step back and say, can we do this? Can we, should we move forward? So Jerry, you say that didn't work and we were to have to build a new one. Would we build it where the old one sits now? Uh, and, I mean, we, we haven't looked at it, but that's that's a good probability we would so we would be uh, estimating that anyway. we would be uh, demoing the existing one and rebuilding in the same location. Okay. So some of those dollars wouldn't be totally lost because we would be yeah. digging that anyway. Okay. On these completion dates, is there a penalty if they don't meet completion dates? <clears throat> there are penalties. Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. I have to look through the contract. Yeah, but penalty, you know, the thing is they're not hard dates. I mean, depending on what you find, if, if conditions are different than what we had anticipated, then there's going to be allowance. But there is set up for liquidated damages at certain certain points. I know you had in your complete within 100 days. That's that's what they're anticipating. Within 150 days. That's what they're anticipating to have, have done. That there is damages if they don't be I, I believe so. And I got this uh, right right before I was leaving on. Well, they have what's called an excuse delay. And I don't know if there's. Uh, Sorry, uh, Alderman, I may not, I don't know that we have damages on this. I think our intent is we need to get it up, we need to get it up quickly. Uh, they're agreeing to have it done by a certain period of time. I apologize. I've It's typical in a uh, construction contract. I don't. And as I'm looking through, I don't. I don't think we do have have damages, but they're also limited on again how how soon they have to get the work done. <coughs> set up is uh, at the completion of the milestone they get their payment yeah. and so with all the payments going to be pretty substantial. So our recommendation is to proceed uh, with the contract and authorize the city administrator to sign. If the uh, board agrees to uh, enter into a contract, then we need to discuss how we, we finance the project. Any further comments? Questions? I will entertain a motion to approve.
Second. I have a motion from Alderman Dalman. Second from Alderman Coburn. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Council Bill 022 becomes Resolution R016. Council Bill 023. An ordinance to amend the Code of Ordinances of the City. Uh, we were going to talk about uh, how we fund it because. Oh, you want to talk about that now? Uh, I thought you meant well, that later. Well, what we need is a. <laughs> you want some guidance? I know what you're looking for. Some guidance, because if we uh, uh, either way we do this, we're going to have to decide where the money comes from. Mm -hmm. And what SAP is recommending is that we take a take out a 10-year loan from Commerce Bank, and the finance director has uh, checked. Uh, lending agencies and they have the, uh, the best rate. And the reason for us recommending doing a loan is that it gives us greater flexibility in the next couple of years as we've got uh, cash going out to pay for uh, projects for the water treatment plant and there's no penalty to pay it off early. And this would just buy us some time to make a decision where if we pay for it out of uh, cash reserves, we won't have a chance. We may not have a uh, project or a situation where we're able to borrow money to pay for it. And so this gives us the greatest flexibility and the minimum exposure uh, thinking uh, ahead <coughs> next couple of years of projects we've got going on. What type of interest rate is it? You know, it's 2.25. Yeah, the other part of our thinking is that uh, we will have this summer or fall, uh, the financing on the water plant improvements through SRF, uh, while there are some assumptions built into that, we don't know, and we won't know until those bonds are actually sold by the state, what that interest rate will be on that and what those finances will be. Uh, you'll recall that's a much larger uh, project money-wise, and so the uncertainty or the unknown part of that, uh, this would give us the opportunity to get that locked in and then we can determine how much we have left to, to do this. We're not, in any case, we're not particularly anticipating having a, an actual 10-year payment on this. It's just sort of some bridge financing until we get the, get the big stuff locked in. So we can bring this up at another meeting for a Right, it would it'd have, to, it'd have to come back before the board, but we wanted to have some direction or some guidance about which way we're... Right. We'd come back with an agreement from Commerce Bank, if that was how we were going to finance, uh, so we'd get that paperwork prepared, and then... Uh, but I, I feel uncomfortable issuing a notice to proceed uh, once contracts are signed until we know how we're going to finance. Uh, I mean, we can certainly say let's start getting the contract documents together, but we now have an obligation, and I like to have the funding uh, clear as as we approach the project. <coughs> sorry. I'm sorry. A lot of her questions. Sorry. Could we ask Marcella what other lending institutions she has contacted? Page 16. Okay. It's, it's outlined um, in the staff report. I talked to MPUA, which is our uh, Missouri Public Utility Alliance, or membership of them. They help with our electricity and they offer short term financing and this type of, of option, as well as talking to our financial analyst. And um, he also did some numbers for me. And neither one of them could be Commerce's uh, quote. Uh, those and you know to, to come down to that amount of money and not have a prepayment penalty and some other issues that would have been involved along with the legalities and some of the other formal financing which is exact, exactly more formal with the financial analysts than it is with MPUA but this was going to give us the least cost and the most flexibility by using commerce keeps it pretty local um, which we like to do too so <coughs> And they had the minimum amount of closing cost. Yeah, uh, so our, our cost going into the loan is going to be uh, So that's why it's, it, it's a good bridge. It's going to be fun. Uh, 
well done. We, we, we do have the CDA <coughs> has a, about a $4 million reserve. So it's not that we don't have the money uh, available to do the project, because that's the other alternative, is to fund it with uh, our reserve funds. <coughs> but with, with the project coming on, you know, we just want to make sure we have enough funds to do the bigger project and, uh, as we pay this off. Penalties for early payment. We thought this would be the best, the best approach. And there's no penalty if it's paid or There's no penalty if it's paid or Oh, I can sell to that. We also have a comment opposed to the idea. It was not that we prepared to talk to the commerce and get an agreement prepared. Sounds good. Come and bring it back to the board for a period. All right. All right. Now we will move on to <laughs> Bill 023. An ordinance to amend the Code of Ordinances of the City of Harrisonville as follows. Chapter 700, Section 700.460, by establishing new rates for municipal water services. Second, this is the second. Yeah, this is the second reading of the ordinance for the water rates we had. Earlier this evening, we had a public hearing. Um, which we uh, was required by SRF. Uh, we had the first reading about a month ago, so this has been out there in the public. Uh, there was one comment at the public hearing, uh, just asking for a clarification of what the new rates were and uh, the comparison between the new and the current rate, and that was it. There's no objection stated. Uh, that hearing's been closed and entered into the record, and so. Uh, this is part of the application process then for our funding. This is one of the hurdles we have to kind of jump through. And uh, so the staff is recommending approval of this. And this is the rate that the uh, DNR said that they would approve our financing. This was the rate that they said the minimum rate we had to have. Um, so we do have their support that this is what's required. Um, so we have that to back us up on this one. Any further discussion? All right. All right. Alderman Stahl? Aye. Alderman Long? Aye. Alderman Bowman? Aye. Alderman Coburn? No. Alderman Dahlman? Aye. Alderman Dickerson? Aye. Alderman Stafford? Aye. Alderman Milner? Aye. And Council Bill 023 becomes ordinance 03358. Council Bill 024. Ordinance to amend the Code of Ordinances of the City of Harrisonville, Chapter 700, Section 400.480, by establishing new rates for sewer services. And this is also a second reading. Any discussion? Thank you. Alderman Coburn? No. Alderman Stafford? Aye. Alderman Milner? Aye. Alderman Long? Aye. Alderman Bowman? Aye. Alderman Dahlman? Aye. Alderman Dickerson? Aye. Alderman Stahl? Aye. And Council Bill 024 becomes Ordinance O 3359. Council Bill 025. An ordinance of the City of Harrisonville establishing a new rate for residential solid waste. <coughs> this is also a second reading. Any discussion? Comments? Alderman Dahlman? Aye. Alderman Dickerson? Nay. Alderman Bowman? Aye. Alderman Long? Nay. Alderman Milner? Aye. Alderman Coburn? No. Alderman Stafford? Aye. Alderman Stoll? Aye. And Council Bill 025 becomes Ordinance 03360. Uh, next, we will certify the election results from the April 2016 election. Council Bill 030. An ordinance declaring the results of the city general election held on April 5th, 2016 for the offices of four aldermen and a ballot question. Discussion? Questions? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to suspend the ruling and move Council Bill 030 to the second reading. So moved. Second. I have a motion from Alderman Coburn and a second from Alderman Dickerson. Alderman Bowman? 
Alderman Dickerson? Aye. Alderman Stafford? Aye. Alderman Long? Aye. Alderman Dahlman? Aye. Alderman Milner? Aye. Alderman Stoll? Aye. Alderman Coburn? Aye. An ordinance declaring the results of the city general election held on April 5th, 2016 for the offices of four aldermen and a ballot question. Alderman Stafford? Aye. Alderman Long? Aye. Alderman Stoll? Aye. Alderman Bowman? Aye. Alderman Dahlman? Aye. Alderman Coburn? Aye. Alderman Dickerson? Aye. Alderman Milner? Aye. And Council Bill 030 becomes Ordinance 03361. This time we will have our swearing in of our new alderman. Mm -hmm. yeah. You all could join can join us I, up front. Can I have the new alderman come forward? Yeah, yeah, it was a good discussion. So <laughs> yeah. I will definitely miss those. So, yeah. 
anyway, good Thank luck you. to you, and we appreciate everything you've done. Thank All right. <laughs> Mr. Coburn, eight years. Yes, sir. What did you learn in eight years? <laughs> it's our city, and I'm just changing seats. You're just changing the seats. Huh? I'm going to move back here. <laughs> yes, sir. Where I was in the me. beginning. All right. All right. Well, Jack and me will make a tea. There you go. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for your years of service, and we greatly appreciate it. I right, thank you. All right. Stacy, you're prettiest. Here we go. <laughs> one more time. Good for you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. We will have a uh, brief recess for a little reception, and then we will reconvene. Are we all invited? Yeah. <laughs>